Interventions with a King. Discussion and commentary based on articles from Jack, Cardiovascular Interventions. I'm Spencer King, editor of Jack Interventions. I'm here today visiting with my good friend Eberhard Grube, talking about the most, uh, the hottest subject, I think, in uh, interventional cardiology right now. Welcome, Eberhard. Thank you very much, Spencer, well, for having me. Yeah, well, as everybody knows, we're having uh, percutaneous uh, aortic valves uh, coming and going and being studied, and now we've had the report of the first U.S. Uh, randomized trial compared to surgery, and we're learning a few things. And uh, great enthusiasm. I mean, I, I think over the top, maybe enthusiasm, and throughout the world, and certainly your experience is enormous. Uh, thousands and thousands of patients have had this. I want to explore with you some of the potential problems, because if it's like any other technology, we're bound to have things that can be improved. So what are the problems with uh, percutaneous aortic valve implantation? I think the partner trial that uh, came out uh, yesterday uh, it's raising some interesting questions, uh, some things that we have known before, but they are really documented now in a randomized controlled trial, which is actually the first trial that puts TAVI into perspective for surgery. And I think we have identified a few things, as you mentioned, uh, very important, uh, the, the stroke rate, uh, very important, uh, interesting, the pacemaker rate, and of course, aortic insufficiency as a consequence of valve implant. I think those are the three major, apart from bleeding, uh, three major um, issues that we have to deal with in the, in the following studies and the following years using this technology. Well, so, uh, those of us who have watched from the sidelines until now, and now we have an opportunity to, to engage in these trials, you, on the other hand, have been around the world putting these in and proctoring people doing this and have observed a, a vast experience and it's, uh, I understand, giving you some ideas about how you might uh, tweak this uh, process a little bit. Tell us about yeah. some of the things you're doing. Well, thank you very much. I think uh, what's, in, what's important is, uh, first and foremost, uh, I believe, and I said this a long time ago, that we have to deal with stroke. Uh, stroke, uh, in many ways, uh, is sometimes worse than death. And uh, if we can avoid stroke, then we have to do that. Um, that uh, brings up uh, interesting new technologies to protect the brain. Um, doing this procedure, procedurally at least, then uh, procedurally we can change and maybe modify our approach to implant this valve uh, by, for example, not using prevalvular plasty, and that's what we have done in uh, some patients uh, with good success. So at least for the core valve implant, we know that we don't necessarily need uh, to predilate because uh, predilatation might be a risk factor for aortic insufficiency if you have heavy calcifications, might be a risk factor for stroke. So um, different exercises um, might reduce the, uh, the, the problem with bleeding and exercise uh, difficulty. Before you get to the excess <laughs> site, uh, some would find it surprising that you could put the valve in this calcified uh, mass and, and uh, have it open and function perfectly well without predilatation, uh, but that, that was surprising to me. Yes, uh, we have done, well, I consider this uh, a s very early step, obviously, um, but I was, I, I was a strong believer in the fact that the radial forces, at least of core valve, is sufficient enough not to predilate the valve. I don't think that in a living, beating heart, valvuloplasty does what it's supposed to be doing crack what we know from the mitral valve, crack the commissure. So I thought it was enough, both from the profile and from the expanding forces, that it is enough to have this valve uh, placed correctly and function normally. And that's what we have shown in uh, about 60 patients, or together 90 patients. Yeah, now. very exciting stuff you're going to read about in Jack Intervention. But the vascular complications are a huge problem with this uh, technology. And I understand you're now interested in different access than just the femoral and the apical. Yes, um, I think the apical is something that we have to re very seriously consider to be an alternative, but <clears throat> on the other hand, we're dealing with puncturing the, the, the heart, and there might be some patients, particularly in this patient group with uh, low ejection fraction, that you might actually interfere with left ventricular function. So I think the transaortic, direct aortic access is a very, uh, very very nice uh, and very promising new approach. 
Uh, uh, the surgeons like it. It's, a, it's an axis that they're very familiar with, a mini sternotomy, and you have direct access to the arch. And, and you're and also doing the subclavian, right? Yes, we're doing the subclavian <coughs> uh, approach. The subclavian artery is a very nice axis because it gives direct access to the heart. Uh, the catheter uh, and, and the, the, the way from the puncture side to the valve is actually very short. And we've done some cases even with uh, percutaneous, direct percutaneous approach of clavian. Yeah, for these patients that uh, we know are elderly and have a lot of atherosclerosis, the, the iliac and the aortic uh, approach uh, in some is just impossible and others uh, high risk. So the chance to do that uh, uh, other ways that could uh, minimize the vascular complication and maybe the strokes as well uh, are very exciting. So thanks for all the work you're doing and uh, thanks for visiting with us uh, today. Well, thank you very much for having me.